Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to the House of Literature in Bergen, and welcome to those who follow this event out there in the world on uh, YouTube. Uh, the topic today that we are going to discuss here today is one that is both uh, novel and I personally find uh, Im immensely interesting, also in the framework of... Uh, heritage discourse, because the, the, the sort of standardized understanding of uh, heritage as voiced by agencies such as UNESCO or heritage authorities in many countries has been that heritage is some form of common. It does not belong to anyone in particular. Like Brigham right here, where we are, almost are, uh, is defined as a common heritage of mankind. And the same goes for many natural conservation areas. Now, this is a legal principle that has been formulated uh, long ago, back in the 60s. It has been controversial, I think, or it is maybe still controversial. And it holds that the common heritage of mankind is held in some kind of trust, uh, normally by a state party. The sea on the other hand, or, or the world oceans are also understood as some kind of common heritage of mankind, especially when you're outside of territorial waters, uh, under the 1982 law of the sea. At the same time, as we know, of course, uh, the immense resources of the sea and the seabed uh, is exploited by both uh, private entrepreneurs and states. And the renewed push nowadays towards a commoning of the sea or these blue commons is a process that is very often based in Western concepts of natural and cultural, cultural heritage, which in turn produces specific struggles and dispossessions. So heritage is never not political. And for that reason, I'm really glad that we have a great panel here today to discuss these matters. Uh, I'm going to introduce each panelist in turn. Uh, we have one and a half hour in total. There will be time for questions from the audience afterwards, or including the audience on YouTube. You will use the chat. Raise your questions in the chat. But first of all, I'm really glad to introduce, uh, I will say, our main organizer and uh, host, uh, Edita Roshko. Uh, she's a social anthropologist and a senior researcher at the Christian Mikkelsen Institute uh, in Bergen. And she's also a fellow of the Young Academy of Europe. Edita's research has taken a broader anthropological perspective on these blue commons that I mentioned, and on heritage, religion, maritime disputes, fisheries, and also uh, military activity in relation to and beyond territoriality. Edita has recently been awarded a European Research Council, an ERC, uh, a starting grant project entitled Transoceanic Fishers, Multiple Modernities in and Out of the South, Ch South China Sea. So congratulations on that. And this will then expand her geographical field beyond Vietnam and China to introduce other oceanic regions, including Oceania, Oceania, West and East Africa. Uh, she's also the author of a book entitled Fishers, Monks and Cadres, or Caders, I'm not exactly how you're sure you pronounce it, which was published in 2020, very fittingly by the University of Hawaii. So Edita will first give a few remarks, then I will introduce the panelists afterwards. Please, Edita. Thank you, Anna, for this wonderful <laughs> introduction. And welcome, everyone. It's a really pleasure to have all of you. Uh, so let me start from earliest recorded uh, history. Seas and ocean always serve humankind as a surface of transportation, but also navigation, spaces for military adventures, and also a home for nomadic uh, groups and pe people. So in the first 21st century, uh, the sea rising level, the plastic pollution, 
depletion of the fish stock and ocean acidification comes into play as well. This environmental and uh, social processes are aggravated by maritime dispute, militarization, illegal fishing, deep sea mining, and toxic waste. So we realize that this human caused impact enter now the public uh, conscious as a problem uh, of for humanity. As these concerns grown, we also realize that sovereignty and property in the ocean remain imprecise subjects of controversy uh, and they present challenges and opportunities, also how to form the ocean governance and also practices, and that comes particularly to the underwater uh, heritage, as Natalie and Zainab today uh, will show. So they are historical traces, whether they are biophysical or sociocultural traces of life, which are recorded in the oceans, and we only actually recently, having uh, modern technology, we are discovering them. And these traces could be ancient shipwrecks, the warships destroyed during violent confrontation, naval uh, encounters, Africans who died during the Atlantic safe passage, and their remains race, rest on the seabed. Also refugees who are trying to reach the Europe uh, through Mediterranean, and their remains also uh, are resting at the seabed. So, we could see that in the 21st century ocean become the player where also museums, archaeologists, treasure hunting, companies, fishers, and heritage tourism enter the scene of heritage culture. But the question is, who owns the, these traces? Who is res responsible for preservation? And which sites and objects deserve for memori memorialization? And how they should be managed? and who and how should benefit uh, from them. And I think uh, Natalie uh, and uh, Zainab answered this question today. So I will transfer now to Anne to introduce uh, Natalie and open the floor for more discussion. Thank you, Edita. You raised the questions very specifically. Uh, so, with all these questions uh, out there, it's an, uh, my pleasure to introduce the first uh, speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Natalie Pearson. She's the Curriculum Coordinator at uh, Sydney Southeast Asia Centre at the University of Sydney, where she is affiliated to the School of Languages and Cultures. Her research focuses on the production, management, and interpretation of underwater cultural heritage in Indonesia. She holds a PhD in Museum and Heritage Studies from 2019, and her first book is uh, due out, actually, this year, entitled uh, Belitung, The Afterlives of a Shipwreck, uh, coming also by the University of Hawaii Press in November this year. Uh, she's also a regular contributor to the media, including the Channel News Asia, the Jakarta Post, and the Conversation. So, please, Natalie. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you, Anna, for introducing me, and uh, I'd also like to extend my thanks to the organisers of today's event, uh, in particular, Edita Roshko, also Knut Rio, and give my thanks to the Christian Mikkelsen Institute and the University of Bergen. First, for inviting me here to Norway uh, to speak at today's event, and also to participate in a truly rich weekend of discussions about heritage, oceans, claim making and the global commons. So I am, as you can probably tell, Australian, um, and today in Australia, it's the 25th of April and we are commemorating Anzac Day, as we do every year. Anzac Day is the date on which the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, Anzacs, made landfall at Gallipoli in modern-day Turkey in 1915. 
It was the first day in what would be a long and drawn out campaign in which many lives were lost on both sides. Even though there are no original Anzacs surviving, the day continues to hold a certain significance. And over the years, its legacy has evolved, and today it is a day for commemorating all of those who have served and died in all wars, conflicts, and peacekeeping operations. So why am I talking about Anzac Day? Well, I was invited here to talk to you about underwater cultural heritage, which is a fancy academic and UNESCO term um, for shipwrecks and other traces of the human past in the ocean and the rivers. So the fact that it is Anzac Day back home helped to sharpen the focus of my talk. Not just, as the promotional material for today's event says, about cultural heritage that is being threatened during war, that is being stolen or targeted for destruction, and there is certainly plenty of that going on right now in Ukraine, but also about heritage that is created during and even by war. I don't want to glorify war or valorise it, in fact, quite the opposite. I want to reflect on the legacy it leaves, about the threats this legacy is facing, and about how we can engage with wartime underwater cultural heritage sites meaningfully, in a way that does justice to both the survivors and descendants of those who fought, as well as the coastal communities now living with this heritage in their waters. So one of my closest friends is Frank McGovern, age 102 years old. He's the last living survivor of an Australian warship, HMAS Perth 1. Perth was sunk by Japanese gun and torpedo fire in February 1942 in the Netherlands East Indies. 353 of Perth's crew died that night, including Frank's brother Vince, who was below decks. Frank was a prisoner of war on the Thai Burma Railway for two years, before being taken to Japan to work in the factories. On the way to Japan, the Japanese transport ship he was in was torpedoed and destroyed by an American submarine. He survived that second shipwreck too, only to be plucked from his lifeboat a few days later by another Japanese ship. In Japan, he lived through the firebombing of Tokyo in March 1945, in which 16 square miles was raised by American bombers. It is the single most destructive bombing raid in human history. Again, Frank survived. But his back was broken when he was thrown into the air, and he was told he was going to be killed if he couldn't walk out of the hospital. He walked out of that hospital with a broken back, and now, as the last living survivor of HMAS Perth, he carries with him the heavy burden of not only his own memories and traumatic experiences, but all of those who have gone before him. Frank will tell you war is terrible, that it is to be avoided, and that the cost of war lasts for years and spreads in all directions. So I want to use my time today to talk to you about the sad fate of Frank's ship, HMAS Perth. And in sharing Perth's story with you, I hope to touch on a few of the issues that arise when a naval vessel, vessel is lost in battle. These include sovereignty, the presence of human remains, the concept of war graves at sea, memorialisation, uh, looting and salvage, the environmental considerations associated with leaking oil and unexploded ordnance, and the sensitivities that can arise between flag and coastal states. These issues aren't relegated to the past. Despite Russia's ambitions being continental rather than maritime, the loss of the Russian cruiser last week, with an estimated 510 crew on board, serves as a reminder of the ubiquity of the maritime domain in current and future conflicts. The families of the men who crewed th this ship are now begging for information, but secrecy surrounds their fate. Naval vessels project strength and power, but when they are lost, they also force us to confront impermanence, vulnerability and mortality of people, of ships, of colonies, of nations. So let me introduce you now to HMAS Perth in order to um, introduce these bigger issues. So Perth was a modified Leander-class cruiser built in Portsmouth by the Royal Navy. So it was um, originally uh, from England under the name of HMS Amphion. And it was transferred to the Royal Australian Navy in uh, June 1939. Um, it was on its way to Sydney, um, coming home for the first time, via the New York World Fair 
in August 1939, when war broke out in early September. Instead of coming to Sydney, it spent six months on patrol in the Atlantic and the Caribbean, making it one of the only Australian warships to serve in that part of the world during World War II. So what you see here, and this photo was used in the promotional material as well, um, is a photo taken by one of its crew, George Hatfield. Um, so George kept a detailed diary, which was strictly against the rules, um, and he also kept a photo album of his time aboard Perth. His son, who uh, is also called George, has graciously shared his father's archives with me. Perth also spent time in the Pacific and the Mediterranean before being sent to the Netherlands East Indies in February 1942 to defend Dutch colonial interests in what we now know as Indonesia. So by early 1942, the Japanese forces were making their southward push uh, through Malaya and Singapore, and Perth was part of a fleet of American, Dutch, British and Australian ships sent to defend, or at least delay, the Japanese invasion of Java. Ultimately, their mission was not successful. The Battle of the Java Sea was a resounding defeat for the Allies, with numerous British and Dutch ships lost. Uh, Perth did survive, however, and along with USS Houston, uh, it attempted to flee these waters and head to the south coast of Java through the uh, Sunda Strait. But they encountered the Japanese Western invasion convoy under cover of darkness arriving into Java. Perth and Houston were completely outnumbered, but they fought until they could fight no more. Neither of them surrendered, and I tell you that not to testify to their heroism, but because it has implications for sovereignty and ownership of the wreck. Had they surrendered, it would have meant that Australia ceded uh, ownership of the wreck. Perth sank in the waters of Bunton Bay after its fourth torpedo hit, shortly after midnight, and USS Houston went down shortly thereafter. Of Perth's 680 crew, 353 died. USS Houston had 1,061 men on board, of which 693 were killed. Most of the survivors were taken as prisoners of war. Japan also suffered damages, but in an indication of the intensity of the battle, uh, these were all caused by friendly fire. So the Japanese ships were hitting each other. Perth came to rest um, in Bunton Bay on its port side, so lying on its left side, in about 30, 35 metres of water. Uh, USS Houston is not far away. It lay untouched for 25 years. And this wasn't deliberate neglect. Instead, it reflected the different priorities of the nations involved. Uh, Indonesia, Australia, and of course, America with USS Houston. There was a sense at that time that the wrecks were protected by virtue of their inaccessibility. The men who died were left in situ. Uh, the idea being that a sailor's grave is in the sea, uh, at least an Australian saver, uh, sailor, the Japanese uh, preferring to recover their maritime war dead. So in 1967, 25 years after Perth went down, an Australian diver set out to find it. His name was David Birchall. Um, he was uh, an accomplished freediver. He didn't freedive on Perth, he scuba dived. Um, he's quite a remarkable man. Uh, he wanted to protect Perth from what he called the diving pirates. So there was already a sense in the late 1960s that um, there were scrap metal salvages operating in Southeast Asian waters. Um, so there, were, there was no legislation in place in Indonesia to protect Perth at the time. Uh, and so he notified Indonesian authorities of his intentions and he also notified the Australian authorities wasn't really getting permission, just letting them know what he was up to. There was no resistance, but there wasn't a whole lot of support either. Um, and when it became apparent that he had indeed located the wreck of HMAS Perth, the Australian embassy in Jakarta sent him some tins of condensed milk to, I don't know, support his venture um, as a, a, a sign of thanks. <laughs> the point being that the Australian embassy was aware that um, Perth had been found. Uh, so when Perth sank, uh, it was largely intact, apart uh, from the, the damage sustained in battle. So this is a schematic of what it looked like in 1967. And just to give you a sense of the scale, um, here's David Birchall drawn to scale. Um, so this is a huge ship, 6,000 tonnes, longer than three Olympic-sized swimming pools. 
Um, and it was also home to a flourishing marine ecosystem. And David Birchall talks about the marine uh, growth and the beautiful life that he witnessed uh, on the wreck in terms of um, sea turtles and gropers, sharks, eels, and uh, this Gorgonian coral that he talks about as a living tribute to the memory of both the ship and the men. So Birchall went there with the intention of recovering some key objects. Ultimately, he wanted to find the bell. He thought there was only one bell. There were, in fact, two. Um, but he wanted to bring home some key objects for the survivors of Perth and bring them back to Australia. This was the start of what researchers call uh, Perth's death by a thousand cuts. So initially, it was the removal of small-scale uh, portable objects and... For David Birchall, he uh, removed the objects. Here we can see the binnacle and the spotlight. And he took them back and donated them to veterans associations in Australia. So he wasn't seeking to profit from them. He wasn't seeking to sell them. Um, but he wasn't successful in his search for the bell. Uh, in fact, both bells were taken by salvagers, uh, who were, as we know, already active in the area. And they had already taken the massive phosphor bronze propellers, which were worth tens of thousands of dollars. So their motivation was profit, looking for um, high value materials uh, and the bell in particular being such a symbolic object on a ship, like a touchstone object, uh, was considered to be of high value. Uh, as I said, Perth had two bells. So this is the working bell. Uh, as you can see on the back of um, the bell, it's engraved with HMS Amphion, reflecting its British um, English origins. And then on the other side of the bell, we have the new engraving for HMAS Perth. Um, now, both of the bells were removed by salvagers. In the case of the working bell, uh, it came to the attention of the Australian Embassy in Jakarta. And a deal was done where... Um, the Australian Embassy took the bell and, in exchange, offered some diving equipment and a boat to the salvagers who had um, brought the bell to them. Um, so no money was exchanged, but they, they offered the, the diving equipment in exchange. And this is a, a picture of um, staff at the Embassy celebrating the return of HMAS Perth's bell. Now, this was the working bell. Um, as I said, Perth had two bells, and um, the story of how the ceremonial bell came to to be returned to Australia is also a very interesting one. Um, here we can see the working bell on display at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. So this is um, the only display of Perth at the War Memorial and it's got a couple of the other items that David Birchall recovered as well. So they've been able to do a small display based around this bell that was recovered by the salvagers. Now, as for the ceremonial bell, um, it was much larger. Um, you can get a, a sense of the scope or the scale of it um, with uh, Leah sitting next to it here. And this was recovered by a salvager as well. And he was actually an Australian salvager doing subcontracting sub work for the Indonesians. Um, and he decided that he really wanted this bell to get back to Australia. So when he found it, when his divers found it, he didn't tell his Indonesian boss. He um, smuggled it to Singapore, um, demanded that Qantas repatriate it because it was a very big and heavy bell, very expensive. Qantas declined and uh, he then approached a Japanese airline, which of course, given the sensitivities of the Japanese sinking of Perth, Qantas quickly came to the realisation that they should be the ones to bring it back to Australia. Um, and so <laughs> a, a, an arrangement was made whereby um, it was initially offered to the Australian War Memorial, but they already had the working bell and they said, we don't want to engage in salvage activities, this is a fake, um, this is not something we're interested in acquiring. So uh, in the end, the city of Perth purchased it with a donation from a local businessman uh, of about $10,000. So today, the ceremonial bell, it's got these beautiful oak leaves around the base, um, is on display uh, in the city of Perth, and you can go and see it. So both bells have come back to Australia. So when David Birchall visited HMAS Perth and rediscovered it in 1967, uh, this is what it looked like, more or less. So you can see the torpedo damage uh, in grey at the front. And we have this image available to us because... Um, Australia and Indonesia cooperated in 2017 to do a dive of HMAS Perth and 
they produced this, this schematic to demonstrate what Perth would have looked like when it was sunk. There wasn't a lot of change between 1942, when it had gone down, and 1967. You can see a few of the missing components, um, but it's largely intact at the time Birchall visits it. So I said that there had been small-scale removal of objects, but in recent years, Perth has suffered industrial-scale salvaging. So this is what HMAS Perth looked like when the Indonesians and Australians did their joint site survey in 2017. There's less than 40% of the vessel remaining. Um, and of course, this was indiscriminate salvaging, uh, and it caused the desecration of human remains, the loss of archaeological context, and a huge upset in the Indonesia-Australia relationship. Um, there was, this is one of the scrap metal salvages, uh, and it, it's a floating barge with a huge crane on it. Uh, we believe that they use uh, uh, explosives to break up the wreck, drop the explosives on the wreck, break it into smaller pieces, and then send this crane over the side that just pulls up the scrap metal. Um, so I've been told that what you can see at the bottom left of the screen here are the boiler tubes, which are made of a particularly valuable type of metal. Um, but generally, um, the, the value here is in the scrap metal, um, of the wreck, so not the archaeological or the historical value, of course. Um, here we can see some of the, the chains that were attached to HMAS Perth to help the salvagers with their, their activities. Um, and then I just also wanted to point to the unexploded ordnance that was um, found on the site. Some of it was exploded, some of it wasn't. Uh, and it poses a danger to divers because the ordnance has been corroded over the years. The salt water has, has you know, caused the pitric acid inside them to leach, and um, you, we've got divers bringing up unexploded ordnance. You know, this is a four-inch, a live four-inch shell um, that somebody brought up and was quickly told to put back over the side of the tinny. Um, so there's also the issue of oil and the potential environmental damage that, um, you know, these issues were already present when Perth sank, but the industrial scale salvaging has really, uh, really exacerbated the threat that Perth is facing and the consequences for the environment and for local communities and divers. So I wanted to put Perth in perspective now, um, just to consider uh, this map of World War II shipwrecks around the world uh, and in Southeast Asia. So I'm telling you the story of just one ship um, with its oil and its human remains and its unexploded ordnance, um, but there are so many of these shipwrecks around the world. As I mentioned, um, the extent of Perth's destruction had been determined by Indonesia and Australia working together on a joint site survey. And the results, the really horrifying results of this survey, prompted um, the lobbying of the Indonesian government to introduce a maritime conservation zone around Perth, which they did in 2018. Um, and you can see the, the conservation zone here on the, on the screen. So finally, we're seeing the flag and the coastal states collaborating as they perhaps should have done many, many decades earlier to prevent rather than react to um, the sad fate of Perth. So they've established a core zone um, and a zone of limited use around the wreck. Um, the core zone uh, activities are very limited, um, and then there's a wider zone of limited utilisation um, where activities such as pilgrimages, water-based tourism, fishing and aquaculture are protected. But the point is you can only visit Perth now uh, with a permit, and it's highly protected, and um, this is a sort of legal protection that perhaps should have been introduced, well, absolutely should have been introduced many decades earlier. So it's uh, seeking to enact this protection around Perth while also acknowledging um, the burden of responsibility for the local communities who have Perth in their waters and have lived with Perth um, in their waters for 80 years. And it exposes the very complicated issues of sovereignty of naval shipwrecks. So it's still the property of Australia as the flag state, um, but it lies in territorial waters of Indonesia. Um, so I explained it the other day as being like an embassy at the bottom of Indonesian waters. Australians can't dive it without permission from Indonesia, and Indonesians can't dive it without permission from Australia. <laughs> so given these complexities and sensitivities, it is hard to understand why Indonesia and Australia have taken so long to collaborate and set up formal mechanisms of cooperation um, through joint site surveys and research partnerships. I am pleased to say that they're doing it now, though. Uh, I mentioned coastal communities, so let me bring them in here. 
Uh, Bunton Bay is a busy industrial fishing port and a place where a lot of aquaculture takes place. Um, the way Indonesian maritime conservations work is that they are rolled out nationally, but um, they're implemented at the provincial level. So this, this is designed to respond to Indonesia's, you know, sprawling archipelago and its um, efforts to decentralise power and uh, empower local and provincial authorities to manage the heritage in their own waters. Um, but it brings with it a huge burden of responsibility for the provincial authorities. Um, there's a lot of costs associated with managing a site of such archaeological sensitivity and significance uh, and of such emotional value for another country. In Australia, there's been some resistance to the idea that Indonesia might dare to benefit from the wreck in its waters, um, and this has been unhelpfully conjured as exploitation of the wreck. Um, but I, I think we need to think about the costs associated with managing the wreck and also of incentivising local communities to care for the wreck. And as Perth's condition continues to change, we need to continu continually reflect on the legacy of Perth and to consider how we can do justice to Perth and to its communities widely conceived. There is a need to broaden the scope of our understanding um, of how we manage naval shipwrecks beyond a conflict-centred approach to one that also creates space for different viewpoints, um, including not only survivors and descendants, but also, as I said, these communities in Bunton Bay. The final issue I'd just like to pick up on is the question of war graves at sea. So this is a poem um, that reflects the views that um, Australian sailors lost in conflict have no grave but the cruel sea, no flowers lay at their heads, a rusting hulk is their tombstone, a fast on the ocean bed. So interestingly, underwater sites are not recognised by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission as official war graves. To be an official war grave, it has to be on land and it has to have a tombstone. So those lost at sea are memorialised in stone at Plymouth in the United Kingdom. You can go and visit the memorial in Plymouth. Um, so there's a real tension between military lost on land and military lives lost at sea and how their burial sites are managed. So the equivalent of the salvage of Perth, were it to happen on land, would be like driving a bulldozer through the cemetery at Fromel. A final image I will leave you with um, is descendant George Hatfield um, paying his respects to his father, who he never met. So George's father died uh, in February 1942 when Perth sank, and uh, his son George was born a couple of months later. George told me that uh, this is the closest he's ever been to his father when he went to throw flowers above uh, the Perth wreck site in Indonesia in 2018. We also see Perth remembered in stained glass windows, in poems, in hymns and odes and in flowers. There would have been a Perth contingent marching on Anzac Day today in Australia made up of descendants and those who have served on Perth 2 and Perth 3. And when the wreck was still intact, we saw divers paying their respects, flying the white ensign, which is the flag, and bestowing wreaths upon the wreck. So there might be some useful material here for our discussion. Um, I will leave it here, I think, and perhaps we can further elaborate on these issues of sovereignty, memorialisation in a wider context beyond Perth, um, and I know there's dangerous naval heritage in Norway as well. Um, I was told yesterday about the German wreck uh, full of mercury in Norwegian waters. So certainly this is an issue worldwide. Uh, time is increasingly of the essence uh, as these wrecks degrade and are targeted um, and as conflict, unfortunately, endures. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Natalie, for this uh, very illustrative history of Perth and uh, alerting us to both the diplomatic, the legal and the environmental uh, implications of, uh, of how, how to deal with this type of underwater heritage, and not least for reminding us for 
about the fact that when you do have underwater heritage, it often means that something has gone terribly wrong. <laughs> that these are often graves, that they, they in fact imply the loss of lives. Uh, we will continue now with our second speaker, who will also draw the examples from Indonesian waters. So I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Zainab Tahir. Uh, she is the Marine Heritage uh, Analyst uh, and Assistant Coordinator for Shipwreck Management Unit in the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries in Indonesia. Uh, Zainab uh, is a graduate of the Hassanuddin University in South Sulawesi in Indonesia, where she majored in archaeology and from the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences at uh, James Cook University in Australia. Uh, she has focused on marine protected area management in her career. Her major responsibilities uh, uh, has been, and, and still are, uh, conducting assessment on underwater sites management, assisting local-based marine heritage tourism, as also was mentioned by Natalie, supervising collections management and operational activities uh, of Marine Heritage Gallery in Jakarta, and also artifacts uh, storage throughout West uh, Java. So, please, uh, Zainab. Thank you. I think I need a helper to, to make me sophisticatedly taller. I bring this, I better read my notes to make it more effective. <laughs> thank you, Anna, for introducing me. And again, thank you, Edita. Thank you, Knut, for having me again in this public event. So, we live or check it, afterlife of commercial salvage cargoes. This is the story of Indonesian, uh, Indonesian policies about underwater cultural heritage management. And I will open the slides by showing the map of Indonesia. And the dots you have seen is um, a shipwreck spot around 900, uh, but probably more, very much likely more. And 1.5 explore commercially, involving private, com uh, private company. And 45 spots, shipwrecks are dive attractions. 46 spots are Second World War. And 10 clearly identified and found significance. But uh, still one of them stated with a, a legally binding status, HMS Perth. Um, Indonesia has ambiguous dualistic approaches in managing underworld cultural heritage, acknowledging the importance of heritage preservation, at the same time promoting monetary value toward commercial exploitations. Accordingly, hundreds of thousands of artifacts has, um, have been recovered from the state's water by profit-making um, third parties. I brought that um, around 230,000 collections. Um, this is only part of the, uh, the split cargoes uh, between company and uh, the government. So the government actually, the state, managed uh, 200,000 collections itself. Um, so under, under the national investment policy, Commercial salvage company allows to salvage underwater, underwater heritage and got 50% and got cargoes uh, as a compensation to the private and another 50% go to the government. 
it considers as cultural resources at the same time under, under the legislations, but in a different regulations considered as marine resources. Several, pro uh, several problematic issues have resulted from the salvage methods involving the company, in, involving private companies. Archaeological documentation that has neglecting the contextual um, integrity of the objects. Facing, facing dispossession of historical context. Some experts actually and scholars reluctant to deal with, um, with studying and managing artifacts that commercially salvage. Negative criticism has forced the object into isolation for many, for a decade, for more than a decade, and prevented the, the interpretation. For more than a decade, hundreds of thousand artifacts stays in the storage. Experts argue Exhibiting collections from commercial salvage activities are sometimes considered contrary to the 2001 UNESCO Convention under Article 14. And, but others also argue that prohibiting commercially, uh, commercially exploited artifacts from public access is in violation of the spirit of 2001 UNESCO Convention itself. So it is. Uh, two voices, two different voices. But I argue that actually we carry social and scientific responsibility to deal with, not to encourage uh, Teresa Hunter for sure, uh, but to reestablish, to reestablish the narrative of these objects amongst the communities from where they were found. And also there is a social rights this is a social rights of the community and also rights of the objects, rights of the objects itself to communicate their self. The status of commercially salvaged artifacts remain as historic and cultural heritage despite the loss of the context. This argument, inspired by Dr. Natalie Pearson through her thesis, a perspective regarding the Belitung right. Natalie convincingly reasoned that by studying this object, we can learn not only about their provenance and the discovery, but as a lesson learned and implement actions for collection management and future archaeological intervention. However, there are a couple questions pop up. Can we, uh, can, can we really rewrite the narrative of the object while the very important context has gone. How and from which part to start to dig the significance of the object after it is take scattered without um, proper documentations. So we try to, several ways uh, we identify to be taken into account to think about those abandoned and open. Some said orphan artifacts. Uh, it should be shown to the public. We need to tell the story to the public, including the process of its salvage. It might be sad, but we need to tell. This is part of the, this is part of the uh, policy. This is part how, how the government or how, um, how we have seen this, how archaeologists uh, seen the policies, how. Uh, how, polit how politics, how economic influences influence um, the way we manage the object. We need to tell the story, and including the controversies of uh, for sure, artifacts are source of knowledge. It contains history of bilateral and multi multilateral relations between regions in Asia and Europe. It shows navigation technologies development, shows trends in consumption, in trade. It carries memory of life, actually. And there must be a place to showcase, to learn, and to promote research. The way, the way includes sharing management responsibility. This is the way uh, sharing management responsibility with local governments, 
and where the artifacts found, for example, in Belitung, Karawang, and uh, and a lot in Belitung actually. And besides thinking of ways for managing the recovered artifacts, it needs also to consider shipwrecks underwater, the site management. This is the way to indirectly build the connectivity of the object and its new context. What, um, quote unquote new context. This is not actually the context, but we need to, when it is about, uh, when it is, when, when we inter interpret the, the site, the, the artifacts, um, particularly the visitors, the visitors, we, of, uh, of course, no archaeology background or, or others um, related to the exploration, but how this is uh, how the artifacts salvage how the artifacts um, what is the process of findings when, so we need to to give them um, a description insights so uh, i don't know is it really a right way to say this is a new context or creating context um, because of um, Commercially recovered artifacts, the sites usually uh, not not uh, recreational uh, recreationally access. It is deep, far away from the mainland. So um, that is the reason uh, we create like a new context of the artifacts, just to give uh, not 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 not. Uh, this is not really the context, but just to give an insight. Uh, the possible way of um, interpreting the sites is embracing this, the community-based heritage tourism. So that's uh, the other way of um, uh, to give afterlife of the of the uh, of the of the underwater heritage, and the other way is. Establishing marine protected area as what well, um, it is very related with um, HMS Perth, what Natalie said previously, and particularly for the Second World War uh, shipwrecks with particular regulated access uh, to public. And in 2017, the idea to build a specific place for showcasing the artifacts is a, is a turning point create accessible learning ecosystem through the Marine Heritage Gallery. And we formed that the gallery is more than a space. It should be a message of responsibility to bring this essential piece of country's identity as maritime nation to public. And this is the appearance of the gallery. And it, uh, it, loca it is located uh, in a government building, so inside government building, this is the second floor of the uh, uh, floor, second floor of the one of the building, the main building at the uh, Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries. Natalie visited, the, and and you might visit if you come to Jakarta. And the gallery serves more than uh, two thousand uh, three three thousand collections from Belitung cargos, from Belitung cargos. Um, consisted the Belitung one consisted of artifacts from nine uh, ninth century, the Tang period, and the second one is a Cirebon cargoes recovered from the northern Cir um, northern ja northern Cirebon uh, coast. This is quite far, um, ninety nautical miles from Java Sea and. 100 more than 100 from Jakarta, 100 uh, nautical miles from Jakarta. This is Chinese, um, Southeast Asian fine paste Chinese ceramics, Middle Eastern glass bottles, and other metals. And this is the largest collections found in, um, in, in Indonesian waters so far. And the Pulau Buaya cargoes recovered from uh, Kepulauan Riau consisted of ceramics and other metals. This is a um, um, Song period, and actually the other idea is, um, but it is, 
it isn't happened yet. The other idea is to reconnect the object with other half. We know that, I mean, 50% of the Belitung wreck, we know it is um, in Singapore. It is an Asian civilization museum. Um, whether it is to form partnership with Belitung and, um, so, and also for Cirebon, um, somewhere in uh, somewhere in museum in Qatar, the the other fifty percent of um, uh, Cirebon one, and for the Pulau Buaya cargoes, it is still in Indonesia. So uh, it is um, this workshop brings a new idea uh, to reconnect the object with the other uh, the other part. Um, this is the, um, the activities at the gallery, turn the gallery as a learning center, and actually friendly place for uh, to play. Uh, because this is in the middle of the government building, uh, it is it becomes an, something like a escape points for the government officers. <laughs> so if they if they have um like a boring boring time, they they just go down and then go around the. And it is uh, actually it is part of the it is part of the rising awareness. Ministry of Marine Affairs. Um, we are not we are not um, we are not like um, really aware about the existence of heritage. We talk about, a lot about fisheries and uh, ecosystem, marine ecosystems, natural ecosystems. Uh, not really aware that heritage is part actually of the oceans. Um, so it is, uh, for my perspective, this is, this is the right place to place it, to raise an awareness, not just public, but also the officials itself. And, and also it becomes executive launch for the minister, the minister guests. Uh, some minister, some ministers visit the minister, the minister of marine affairs. It, uh, they must be before coming up to the to the minister's office. It is a showcase for uh, it is a showcase for them. So uh, hope that it brings a positive, uh, positive, positive uh, impression and. The gallery has monthly learning session, has con uh, conduct monthly learning session since 2017, but during the pandemic it holds online, including the virtual tour. And build partnership and advertise the existence uh, with Google to establish, with Google, Art, with Google Asia Pacific uh, to establish dashboard in Google Arts and Culture dashboard. Uh, it is ongoing. And with Australia, uh, we work Indonesia Museum linkage with Australia Indonesia Museum linkage for virtual exhibition together with 12 museums uh, from Indonesia and Australia. And also to include the gallery, to include the gallery as a member for Indonesia Museum Monument and Gallery Associations. It is the way to, to, to show the existence. The gallery, is, the gallery itself is, uh, should be exist among the, the other museums and gallery in Jakarta and also in Indonesia. And this is the example of the collections of the gallery. And the other, um, the other way of um, showing the afterlife, uh, what to do with them, um, uh, the, uh, the heritage, whether it is salvage or underwater, so, so is strengthen the ties. Uh, I put it, the title, strengthen the ties. Forcing the management intervention into, uh, is to place them into regulations, to give it a legally binding um, status. This is the way to catch an attention and, and it will strengthen the existence of the object. So there are, uh, there are three things to integrate its management into village-based marine ecotourism decree. 
it is ministerial decree and to integrate its management into marine conservation policies, it is also ministerial decree, and to regulate display management and shared responsibility mechanism with local government and other institutions. And it is uh, also ministerial decree, but under the different ministry. And we, uh, we have shown this, it has by giving the uh, legally binding uh, status of the management strategies, we have seen we can impose more, we can, we can persuade more um, uh, through government force. <laughs> and, and this is the example of the management program to endorse interpretation through tourism development under the 18, um, 18 DAF under water, uh, under the, under the, uh, this ponton lies Netherlands uh, shipwrecks, shipwrecks, yep, Second World War Netherlands shipwrecks. So the, the ponton itself uh, functioned as a like, floating information sensor and also the uh, mooring system. So uh, boat and, and divers only uh, allow to to go down uh, through this uh, platform. And it is um, facilities managed by uh, local communities. And it is 2000, uh, 2015. So this is the, the last slide. And ethically salvaged artifacts remain as a um, historic and cultural heritage despite the loss of its context. We, heritage managers, scientific communities, carry a social and scientific responsibility to reestablish the narrative of these objects amongst communities from where they were found, and even larger community, a global community, as we, as shipwrecks, um, as a um, heritage of mankind, if we believe uh, underwater heritage is a heritage of mankind. And abandoning the historical resources, from my perspectives, is um, a failure of a building the connection, a connection between the community and objects. It is a matter of people, not the cultural resources. And artifacts recovered from underwater are knowledge, resource, knowledge source and contains lesson learned of its political position and story how community value the resources. Thank you. Maybe you can just uh, stay, actually. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Zainab. Uh, for this very informative uh, overview and talk of how the Indonesian authorities and, uh, deal with uh, the, the underwater heritage and the administrative and legal framework and not least the practicalities of uh, bringing this, giving these uh, items an afterlife, if you like, or, or, or giving, as you ended with, giving these orphans uh, a new home. <laughs> which I, I thought was a beautiful way of putting it. Uh, I would like now to invite uh, all the panelists uh, up here, our two speakers and uh, two discussants. And I remind the audience, meanwhile, that uh, you will also have the possibility to ask questions. And I remind the audience on YouTube to... Uh, prepare your questions uh, through the chat. You will now be familiar with the people who are on the panel, with the exception of our uh, second discussant, uh, all the way at the end, Professor Knut Rio from the Bergen University Museum, the Department of uh, Cultural History in that museum. Knut Rio is a social anthropologist, he has extensive, I would say, lifelong uh, field experience from Oceania, Oceania, but also from uh, Norway. 
His research has focused on heritage politics and the defining of commons and all the issues related to this commoning process. Uh, he has also worked on the ethnographic collections in the University Museum of Bergen, many of them of colonial origin, which again brings up a whole, whole uh, I don't know even what to call it, Sareptus uh, <laughs> uh, pot. Uh, maybe I'd like to ask Knut first to start your discussion and raise questions for the panelists, and then we'll move to Edita afterwards. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you very much. Um, can you hear me now? Is it good? Um, yeah, thank you very much, Natalie and Sainab, for joining us here in Bergen. It's been a fantastic weekend. Uh, we've had a week... We, we, so this is in the middle of a discussion we're having. Mm -hmm. We've spent a weekend together. Almost everyone here is part of that discussion. So, and we kind of, uh, we're trying to figure out some issues around both heritage and commons. And um, it's not very easy. And I think these two papers kind of illustrate the problems that we are in the middle of, you know, when, we, when we're talking about uh, what heritage is and what the commons is. <clears throat> so, um, I guess when we're talking about the commons, we have some kind of idea of something being accessible for a community of people. And in a, in a sense, a, a root metaphor for um, commoning practices is actually the sea. So, so you might say that the sea is a, the prototypical uh, commoning uh, concept in a way, since this, we have this, we're, we're used to thinking that the sea is available to everyone, and the sea is, is a floating terrain that no one can actually own or, or pin down or territorialize, in a sense, even though it's not true, of course. But there's something interesting here when we're looking at the sea um, versus the, the, the land, so the versus the territories. And it's also then interesting to think about heritage in that, in that sense, since heritage is also supposed to be a commons. So it doesn't actually make, it make sense to think about heritage as individually owned or even privatized, you know. So it's, it doesn't really make sense to... If, when you're trying to privatize heritage, you're, you're actually getting, a, you're getting into some de definitional problems, in a, in a way. And, um, but of course, when we're talking about heritage, um, we are into the terrain of what has been inherited. So it's a, always a question of something being handed down from the past, something... Uh, uh, being part of the, uh, the her inheritance of the nation. So it's, it's quite quickly, in, um, in opposition to, to uh, in contrast with the commons, heritage is very quickly being um, drawn into the territory of the nation. And this weekend we've uh, had papers discussing exactly you know, the, the geopolitical situation of heritage and the sea, since the sea is now becoming such a, a geopolitical hot terrains for um, the, the questions surrounding national uh, authority, national so sovereignty, national rights in the seas. So um, uh, Tim Winter has this weekend talked about, uh, you know, uh, you have the African uh, nations building up a claim to the sea, you have India building up claims to the sea, China, Indonesia, Australia around this area, this area that we've been talking about today, uh, around Indonesia, which, where Sinaib works. So there's something very interesting going on here. And to some degree, these shipwrecks that you've been talking about, mm -hmm. they illustrate that very well, because they, they, they um, in a sense, belong to... They have kind of a national belonging, uh, like Natalie's uh, warship. It kind of belongs to this very important war history of Australia, Australia's participation uh, in the Second World War. You, man you mentioned Anzac Day, you know, which is the big national day for Australia. And, um, and by, just by its presence there in the sound of Java, Java it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a pa painful presence in a way, because it's an Australian uh, memorial uh, site but it's in the middle of uh, Indonesia's waters. So there is a sense of a shared heritage, 
but it's share, it's it's sharing is a, it's a pain, it's a painful thing in a way you know so uh, for manage, managers of heritage it becomes painful because in the middle, it's in the middle of international waters in a sense uh, so I, I guess I have you know there's there's a lot of questions and, and we're in the middle of dis discussing them but I guess one uh, one kind of intriguing thing is the question of um, what is the difference between heritage when it's at sea and when, it, when it's mm -hmm. on land. And uh, I think that Anna mentioned it, that uh, often the heritage at sea is actually a painful heritage in that sense. Whereas normally we think of heritage as a form of wealth, a form of giving well-being to the, the people of the nation, belonging to that stock of valuables that the nation or a community of people value, you know. Uh, that produces re regeneration and reproduction between generations. So it's handed down, it's transmissed to, uh, between the generations. Um, and it's, it's, in a sense, a little bit different than to think about heritage at sea. And that is maybe because, and that might be a question to both of you, why, wh what it is with this heritage at sea which makes it uh, difficult to use as directly as valuable for the nation uh, or um, for a national reproduction of, um, of value, in a sense. Mm. Um, another thing is um, there is, in a sense, also, and we've been discussing this as well, there is, in a sense, um, a sliding of meaning to do with heritage. I think maybe coming out of the whole uh, repatriation debates, the, the restitution going on between the former po uh, colonized populations. And uh, uh, you have, uh, like here in Norway, you have the, um, the giving back of ancestral bones uh, to the Sami populations, for instance. And so uh, it's, there is kind of a move, general move, uh, back, uh, back from that idea that, that heritage is just a way of of cementing a, gi a given history of the past and uh, a move towards uh, a focus on heritage and futurity in a way. So, so when, you, when the Sami uh, group or village or town, when they take back the bone, ancestral bones and rebury them up in their lands, it's about re reclaiming also the lands and making the lands living again, in a sense. So bringing the, the land and the Sami um, in, uh, uh, legacies back to life, in a way. And, you, and that kind of might be a second uh, point uh, with regard to uh, maritime heritage or um, shipwrecks, uh, whether, uh, whether they can be seen, you know, we, Natalie has talked about this, whether you can actually look at a shipwreck which might never come out of the sea, you know, so it would probably be very costly to bring back the Perth to Australia, which, but, you know, which would be an interesting idea to bring it to land, so to speak. But um, if that wreck, shipwreck has some meaning, being there underwater as a continuing presence underwater, not necessarily as belonging to the past, but belonging to the futurity of the seas as a growing environment for fish and, and species, um, and uh, as a source of tourism, as uh, Sainab talked about, a uh, source for uh, commercial activities for local communities, as I know that Sainab is um, uh, uh, working on. So I guess those are my kind of opening points um, for you too. Maybe you want to comment. Would you like to go first, Sainab? Um, you've, you've asked a, uh, a question there, Knut, that um, sounds really simple. Um, what is the difference between heritage at land, uh, on land and heritage at sea? Um, but I confess I find this a very difficult question to answer. Uh, and whenever I'm thinking with shipwrecks, I'm always thinking, well, how is this any different to the problems that we're facing on land and the contestation and the claims that are being made? Um, so I'm still working towards a, you know, a proper response to that question. I mean, I think some of the 
The differences that leap out at me initially would be issues like conservation. So pulling a shipwreck out of the water requires a huge amount of resources, desalination, conservation, investment of that um, to make sure that it doesn't fall apart as soon as you pull it out of the water. Um, they're hard to access. So um, you, ne you need to have the, the privilege of having the money to be able to dive, um, the able body to be able to get into the water, um, someone to look after the kids at home. Um, so it is limited, limited to a fairly elite group of people, whether they're working for the government or they're recreational divers. Um, so I think the question around access is an interesting one. But of course, there are heritage sites on land that are difficult to access as well. So um, I think constantly it, uh, dealing with underwater cultural heritage makes us rethink how we approach terrestrial heritage. So uh, there's uh, a lot of discussion about loss and decay um, and, uh, you know, the, the preservation parati paradigm, the urge to protect and preserve in a terrestrial context. And thinking about those issues in an underwater cultural heritage context, I think, can help us revisit how we're thinking about them terrestrially. Um, and then there's the, the fundamental fact that shipwrecks, sailing vessels, um, are transnational, most of them, transnational in nature. In nature. So they're mm -hmm. constructed somewhere, they're um, owned by people somewhere else, they've got insurance which is, vests them somewhere else. So they traverse and, and, and confound boundaries. Um, so I think that's one of the most interesting aspects for me in terms of underwater cultural heritage versus terrestrial heritage. But again, it's not a blanket rule. So um, there's some of my initial responses. Uh, thank you. And Natalie already highlights the accessibility and also the um, highly investment for treatment. And what is the... Um, the slightly difference uh, between the heritage at sea and inland is the intactness. Mm. Uh, we often, we mostly found the wreck, wreck is completely fine the, in a whole context. Mm. And the, the, that's why we call it time capsule. Mm. And we can see a whole, um, if it is ex excavated, interpreted, um, and mindfully, scientifically, it can it it draws us um, a life of the um, a life of the um, uh, navigation. What has happened on board, and what has happened with the um, the 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 life before the uh, the ships uh, from its destiny, from its origin, and from her origin, mm -hmm. from her origin to the to destination or before um, before or before the wreck uh, the ship uh, get into the destination so and also uh, it is interesting question the intactness uh, it might be a point a discussion point that intactness also um, might be the source of um, because it has a complete story it might be a source of claiming as well, mm -hmm. while in land, um, in land mostly it is, uh, the the uh, artifacts that we found is scattered, scattered, and and uh, while at sea it is it is completely we can we can we can see the story behind we can see the memory a complete memory mm -hmm. uh, through the the artifacts found. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Edita now yeah. to follow up. I will be rather brief to give a chance others to, to ask questions, but I was when I was listening, both of you, I was thinking about underwater heritage as a kind of new knowledge frontier, basically. That is new uh, knowledge frontier of about the world, about how we think about the world, and what Actually, what you both show that is the the seabed actually could be the center of human history, whether this is the <laughs> the world history, black history, uh, but also comes this uh, kind of different uh, national and local histories which come to uh, to the fishermen. So, 
I think my question first to Natalie is, uh, how, how do you think how underwater heritage might change the meaning of the ocean or how we think about the ocean in relation to uh, global history and local history, national history, and how sea territory is produced and with what, what effect on sovereignty, because these issues of sovereignty uh, and history is also connected. And um, Zainab, I have a question to you, uh, very quick, because uh, you beautifully said that, you know, these objects are the containers of knowledge. There is a rights of the community and rights of the objects, which shows basically that heritage is not a thing, it's a kind of process um, which involves groups, organizations, institutions, which are co basically co-produce. Um, the whole our authoritative knowledge around the uh, heritage. So how do fishing communities, which are usually the first to discover shipwrecks lying beneath ocean, could have ownership of such discovery and what that would mean for them? I'll jump in first. Uh, you asked how underwater cultural heritage changes the way we understand o the ocean. Um, I think there's a couple of ways. I mean, UNESCO talks about underwater cultural heritage as part of shared humanity, so you can think about it in those terms as the, the common heritage of, of humankind. Um, you can think about the sea as an archive, a repository of material. Um, again, UNESCO describes the ocean as the biggest museum in the world, which I think is a really interesting way of phrasing it. Um, you know, there's three million ancient shipwrecks, so we can think about these as a type of archive that we can um, tap into. Um, I think underwater cultural heritage reminds us that the sea is connective and that it connects people and place, um, but it can also be a barrier. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Zainab just used the word time capsules and they are the most uh, sophisticated objects that humans were making before the mm -hmm. Industrial Revolution. Um, so uh, thinking about it as a seabed, about the seabed as an archive and as a, a connective device. Um, Tim Winter has also talked a lot about the geocultural uses um, and how they're being, uh, you know, the Maritime Silk Road is being operationalised through the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, where they're found, what they're carrying, um, where they were going, these are all part of the, you know, discussion around uh, who can claim them, um, who's responsible for protecting them, who can benefit from them. Um, and I think it can re they underwater cultural heritage, and we're talking specifically about shipwrecks here. Um, there are lots of different types of underwater cultural heritage, of course, but I think with shipwrecks, they can reaffirm national claims and boundaries mm -hmm. um, while at the same time also problematizing them. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Oh, I didn't, I didn't talk about sea sovereignty. Maybe we can come back to that. Maybe the no, you can finish it have more questions about sovereignty, yeah. so we could confirm. <laughs> Zainab? Uh, me? Uh, okay, ocean. I will start from ocean. Um, ocean is not only ecosystem or habitat of living and non-living creatures. UCH, mm. uh, Natalie also highlights, um, and World cultural heritage proves us ocean as a bridge connecting us, mm. continents, regions, and people. Relations between ocean and human, or I might be say that the dependence of human into ocean might create maritime civilization. And, and for the ownership of fishermen, Indonesia, and, um, Indonesia regulations actually allows local community to own, to own cargoes as long as it is registered. Mm -hmm. As long as it is registered, and and as long as the the state already uh, has that kind of collections, that's the uh, when we talk about ownership, and also regulations of when we talk about management, um, it community community groups or uh, community groups. Uh, freely to 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 manage to manage the uh, to manage the heritage to manage the sites. We encourage um, the community uh, to be involved actively in management and in in and 
utilizing the objects for their uh, benefit in sustainable and appropriate way, and in, in a mindful way uh, for sure. For, for example, through tourism, mm -hmm. tourism, tourism development, and if we can say that part of um, community ownership of the of the wreck, but if if, if ownership uh, if we give a meaning ownership that uh, as um, I own this, uh, Indonesia actually uh, under Indonesia regulation it allows. So I can have, uh, for example, this is artifacts. I can have this artifacts as my uh, my personal belonging as, as long as it is registered under mm -hmm. under the Indonesia regulations. And for sovereignty, I have also. Um, as short notes that regarding UCH and sovereignty, I it depends on the type of uh, sovereignty that can influence that might influence the the the, the sovereignty. It depends on um, lesson learned from Sipadan Ligitan Island. Lesson learned from Sipadan Ligitan Island, um, the conflict between Indonesia and Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, under international court, it is decided. Uh, it decided to uh, the Sipadan Ligitan part of Malaysia, because of the because of the continued display of authority. Uh, they have a historic um, lighthouse. Lighthouse mm -hmm. is there, um, and a proof of um, activities during uh, 50, 50, for over fifty mm -hmm. years ago. And it means that so uh, it is kind of continued activities, not just a passing activities, but continued activities. Uh, so uh, like just lighthouses are a really uh, structure uh, that can, can uh, prove, for example, prove that uh, the the presence of the the presence of the uh, British uh, actually at that time because uh, Malaysia uh, Malaysia used to be colonized but colony, is a yeah. common yeah. Brit Commonwealth and um, mm -hmm. and it it relates to the uh, to the to the uh, the country that colonized the the, the island so uh, is it is it possible for claiming it is possible it is possible but uh, it must be proved um, as a continued continued activities happen in the area. Uh, this is my perspective. Of course, international laws. We need a perspective for international laws. Well, if we're talking about sovereignty, we of course have to mention the United Nations Convention yeah. on the Law of the Sea. It, it and, is. Yeah. And the way it intersects with the 2001 Convention on the Protection of the Underwater mm -hmm. Cultural Heritage. And, you know, this is a way, the UNCLOS is a way of dividing up sea territory. So we have the territorial waters, the exclusive economic zone, um, the sort of high seas, the area. Um, I guess I would just make a, a point here in, in talking about how the sea is governed and carved up and regulated. And it's that cultural heritage was kind of, if you think about a hierarchy of considerations, mm. cultural heritage was pretty low down the <laughs> list. So when they were developing, when they were developing the um, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, the consideration given to historical and archaeological objects at sea was something that they only brought in at the last minute, um, in the last few days of drafting. Um, if you read the UNCLOS, you can see mm. it's very imperfect and ambiguous. Um, and, you know, now it's framed as UNCLOS left the door open for a new convention, um, which they did. So mm. um, that new convention um, was introduced in 2001 and came into effect in 2009. Um, it's been slow to be ratified. Um, and when they were drafting that 2001 convention on the protection of the underwater cultural heritage, again, certain countries were introduced into that um, discussion process earlier on and other parts of the world, um, including Latin America and Asia, were left out of discussions until until the end. So it's not just a hierarchy of like the resources in the sea in terms of marine mm -hmm. resources and fishing and then historical and archaeological objects, but also um, a hierarchy in terms of who got to have a say 
um, in how sovereignty was exercised over, <coughs> over these resources. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, about five minutes left, meaning that we have time for maybe one question from the floor. Tim, maybe? But uh, can I ask you to <laughs> keep it specific, just uh, in the interest of the okay, cut off time? Um, I did have some comments around... Um, Knut's question around what's the difference between land and water, but maybe for after the session we might just carry on. We're not yeah. going to be kicked out, right? So the uh, question is, that was a, a fascinating couple of papers uh, or presentations, and it seems like the undercurrent theme was heritage diplomacy within it. So you talked about the actors of uh, the um, primarily Australia and Indonesia. Brief mention of the UK, but did Japan figure into this story? Because you mentioned Japanese uh, airlines briefly, or Japan Airways. Um, were there other, and then were you approached by Japanese organizations? Did they get involved? Was the UK involved? And you had not lots of non-state actors involved. Mm. So could you tell us a bit more about any of that that might be part of the story that you, perhaps you didn't have time to cover? Thank you, Tim. Um, it is interesting question. It's about Japanese. Uh, how this um, uh, four country plus Jap uh, with Japanese, four country, Australia, um, America, U.S. and uh, um, U.S. Uh, Netherlands and uh, uh, British. Uh, four of them, or five of them, including Japanese, has some um, uh, have a different uh, way of of uh, diplomacies or approach. Um, they are, uh, for example, for example, for example, Australia approach uh, through uh, universities. First, first uh, through na with, uh, through military military navy to navy, but and it, it changed to um, um, university and museums, and. Does it then go transformed from becoming a warship to heritage? Because mm. it's a warship, right? It's not a heritage. Mm. It has to be produced as heritage. So but, I imagine the diplomacy does that. Yeah. But under under UNCOS, uh, when it comes. Um, a warship sank. Um, uh, actually, UNCLOS stated as an archaeological object. It, um, it doesn't state that warship as a um, warship sank and uh, sank uh, sinking in in other state waters uh, as a heritage, not. But it is uh, defined as archaeological objects. So we define it a warship uh, through its history behind as archaeological and historical objects. And for for Japanese, I um, we might need uh, we might need uh, like uh, insight for uh, international law regarding war, or because um, Japanese does a, Japanese does a, Japanese the uh, Japanese government doesn't uh, seem to 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 more care about the wreck, but they concern about um, they concern about bone, human, mm -hmm. human remain in wreck. Mm -hmm. So they do repatriations. Mm -hmm. They concern a lot to do repatriations of the um, of the bone, but not um, not 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 talking. There is no talk about um, or diplomacy or discussion with the Indonesian government regarding the regarding the protection of the wreck. Um, so Indonesia and Australia and America and Britain, I think, and the Netherlands has signed, but those other countries have not signed the UNESCO Convention on the Protection mm. of the Underwater Cultural Heritage. And for it to be defined under that convention as cultural heritage, it needs to be more than 100 years old anyway, which um, in this example, the World War II war warship is not. Um, but I think your question was about how this heritage diplomacy or cultural diplomacy has produced a warship as heritage. And I think that has been, um, you know, key to what are unfortunately efforts that are coming quite late in the piece um, to... Uh, 
protect and preserve the wreck and um, to think about other ways of valuing it beyond its warship status and its presence in Indonesian waters in defence of Dutch colonial interests, not Indonesian Javanese interests, um, and broadening it as a, you know, our considerations of it to, to include it, it as a heritage site and, you know, it's been recognised as a maritime conservation zone, not as a cultural heritage site. But these are all different ways of conceptualising value from this shipwreck. Claiming it and also, you know, I think um, providing um, area, uh, ways in for different actors, non state actors and non-state actors, to not just claim it but also to care for it and maybe become invested in its telling its story or, you know, thinking about how they benefit from it, whether it's through the fish or, or you know, whatever it might be. So I think that that's quite an effective strategy in my view. Um, unfortunately, it's um, coming after 40% of the wreck has been um, removed. Yeah. Do you mind if I now, for the sake of the online production, uh, close? And I'm sure we can continue sure. our discussion. Uh, I want to thank, uh, before I thank the panel, I want to thank uh, the Christian Mikkelsen Institute and the University of Bergen, whose uh, co-production this is, and also the House of Literature for, for housing us. <laughs> And uh, I encourage all the viewers out there to follow the Transocean project on the Thank CMI you. website and uh, also follow the individual presenters who have been with us here today. So first and foremost, thank you to you and to the discussants. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Natalie and Aina.